Sometimes the best way to find out about who you are and what you're about is to get away from home. We are surrounded by stories of such personal discoveries from the Wizard of Oz to the Lord of the Rings. And these stories, which eventually became major motion pictures, the hero or the heroine leaves the comfortable surroundings of their homes. They go to a place that is unfamiliar and they come home changed by the journey. There are a lot of things that our contemporary culture takes for granted, which for our medieval forebears could have had the potential of being life-threatening. And one of those is travel. We so-called modern people don't think anything of hopping onto an aircraft, and by some miracle several hours later, we land across a continent or even an ocean. But for our ancestors, travel was fraught with risk. It was seen as being dangerous and laden with peril. So every aspect of their journey was an opportunity for intercession, a plea to God for safety, a chance to find the consoling face of Christ and those who were met on the way. There are still places in the world that retain such a sense of pilgrimage. The Camino de Santiago to Compostela in Spain is a famous example of such a sacred journey. But few of us, even the privileged that might be able to take time away from work and family, can undertake such a journey. What does this notion of pilgrimage have to say of our mission as a choir? In the folk choir, whenever we travel, even if it is just to a neighboring parish in Mishawaka, whenever we leave Notre Dame, we are on pilgrimage. It is an intentional word, as intentional as our evening prayers with the ensemble are. What you call a thing in many profound ways determines what the outcome and what the insights will be. Call it a trip, and you will have the experiences of a trip. Call it a pilgrimage. Now the experience can take on all kinds of dimensions that the secular world cannot see. Sometimes our journeys are very parochial. We travel to a parish in Chicago to offer a concert. We prepare a workshop of sacred music for a deanery. Sometimes the places we visit are an expression of the corporal works of mercy. When, for instance, we travel to Indiana State Prison in Michigan City to sing a concert for the offenders there. As I've said before, every two years we get on a bus and head to the Abbey of Gethsemane. These retreats are journeys, spiritual journeys. But along with them, yearly, we make pilgrimages to cities across the United States and Canada as well. And in the grand scheme of things, every four years, the choir heads overseas, most often to Ireland and Scotland, to foster liturgical involvement in those countries, most especially with our young people. How do you define a journey as a pilgrimage? Certainly, I think, not just by calling it such. The travels, just like rehearsals, need to be framed by a sense of the holy. So when we leave our campus, we don't just jump on a bus and take off. We have one of our Holy Cross priests climb aboard and we take a few minutes, intentional time, to invoke God's blessing upon our trip. We ask for protection. We call to mind the pilgrims that have both come to Notre Dame and those who have left as well, all on a journey to find both themselves, to find the gospel and announce it, and get closer to the mystery of God in their lives. This doesn't take a lot of time, but it is intentional. It marks our beginning. When we go on pilgrimage, many things happen. Our students stay with host families the entire way. These hosts have their own stories, their own involvement in a parish community. They open their doors to strangers, sharing their food and the comforts of their home. 
The folk choir never stays at hotels when we journey or hostels. We always work with parish contacts and host families. And so every night, our students have a profound experience of hospitality and plenty of pretty hilarious stories to share as well. Additionally, each church we visit has a profoundly different lens or filter that opens up the face of Christ for us. Whether it be an upscale suburban parish or a community of meager means, each one, when they open their doors, allows us the grace of being welcomed, the privilege of joining them in prayer and song. Parish priests bless them, and parish families make them part of their own homes. For our longer journeys, ones lasting more than a week, it becomes important, no really necessary, to find a place with the choir to get away for a few hours and do some serious faith sharing at the end of our pilgrimage. On the last day of any long journey, we find a place that could probably be called an upper room, and we go there as a group to talk, to reminisce, to contemplate what we've experienced together. In this way, we also end our travels with intentional time as well. Sometimes this can be a bit of a trick, but with the proper planning and the right priorities, we have been able to do this every time we have a major excursion. We end our journey by taking a lot of time, usually three to four hours, of reflection, observation, camaraderie, laughter, and retrospect. Now you might say, that's great. You have a budget and a big program. That's not what our little parish choir is about. But I would say to you, even when our choir was young and we were barely scraping by year to year, we adopted these ways. We made little trips to parishes. We found ways to be away from the university to discover more of who we were and what we had to offer, what our song was about. Taking time for intentional prayer doesn't cost any money. Rather, it simply asks for a bit more preparation. Taking time for prayer and reflection is not a budget item. It's simply something that needs to be made a priority, an integral part of the pilgrimage. Whether you travel to a neighboring parish or another country, it's not the distance that counts. It's the intentional time you take to engage in prayer and reflection. Am I not the source of your joy, my beloved? Listen, put it in your heart. No soy otro madre, la fuente de tu alegría. Put it in your heart. Escucha, put it in your heart. There are several words I gravitate toward in terms of a grounded Christian spirituality, and one of them is the word admiration. It comes from the Latin word admirari, which means to wonder. And wonder is at the root of so many of our profound stances. We wonder at marvelous stories. We talk about taking trips to see the seven wonders of the world as if it were a holy pilgrimage, which in many ways it is. Psychologists talk about wonder and admiration as a foundational way to repair broken relationships. And for us adults, wonder is a way to enter back into some of the sacredness of childhood, which is perhaps one of the reasons why we never tire of hearing stories. 
As a choir director, I find that wonder, especially in the realm of Catholic sacred music, wonder is an absolutely essential component in understanding the spirituality of what we do. Perhaps it would be better to illustrate this rather than just explain it. When our choir begins the academic year in mid-August, we begin a year-long journey into a whole realm of cultural and liturgical expression. We sing Irish sacred music, sometimes even in Irish. We sing African liturgical music, accompanied by the happy drum, the djembe. We sing the very affectionate music of Guadalupe on December 12th, the Virgin of Tepeyac's feast day. And we sing this repertoire in Spanish. And through this temporal journey, we find that each culture has its own gift to give. The aching and lyrical lullaby facets of Irish song, wrapped up in the whole tragedy of the potato famine, their expatriation, and their struggle for freedom. It just seems to be caught up in all these tunes. We sing the percussive, heart-grabbing rhythms of African music, so caught up in movement and visceral joy. What Europe did for harmony, the Africans did with rhythm. We sing the easily harmonized and romantic accessible tunes of Mexico. We sing the noble and simple tunes, pentatonic songs from our own American Appalachian foothills. And we sing the work of the masters of our European heritage as well, Handel and Mozart and Rachmaninoff and Faure. Each tradition, each genre, has its own spirit-inspired, authentic and marvelous gift to give the listener and the singer. And as a choral director, it is partly my vocation and my great satisfaction to open up my choristers to the joy of each of these expressions, these cultures of the family of humanity, leading them to a stance of admiration. Admiration, that attitude that allows us to stand in wonder of the Irish, of the African, of the Mexican, of the French, of the folk music of our own ancestry. Admiration, which allows us to not disdain the simple or the tuneful. Much of the sacred music of this world is simple, but the truths expressed by this music are profound, even ineffable. Even the greatest composers of their ages borrowed from the simple. Beethoven did it with his great final ninth symphony, rooting the entire thing around a simple bar form hymn. Copland did the same thing with one of his own great masterpieces, Appalachian Spring, which culminates with the noble shaker tune, Simple Gifts. Simple tunes they were, but even the great musical geniuses of their time recognized them for the diamonds they were. We too must open the eyes of our singers to these treasures. Not all the great or praiseworthy songs of the world are complicated to perform. Some of the most plaintive, evocative tunes of the Irish are the ones that draw highest praise and most frequent use after we introduce them to communities around the world. Here's an example of a very simple Irish tune entitled O Mary of Promise, which is based on an ancient melody called Siobhan Niliri, which means Jean O'Leary. <laughs>
As a choir director, our work is similar to that of our Creator. At the end of the day, as is told us in the book of Genesis, God looked back on what had been created, and God called it good. And that is what we must do as well. We must look at the families of humanity here on this earth and embrace them, not just conceptually or in our heads, but with our hearts and our voices as well. By our singing, we call it good. We can introduce our singers and our instrumentalists to the unique and profound joy that all the cultures of this world have developed through the passing of the ages. So here's a question for you as you plan your liturgies week to week. How expansive is your embrace of the faces and voices that God put on this good earth? How do you model, through your choices, the stance of admiration toward the beautiful traditions of song and spirituality found in all four corners of the world. There is great joy to be found here, and it is a joy your choir can take up like a banner. Take it up and let it be unfurled in the hearts of your assembly week after week.